distribution was exactly like this. I knew part of my distribution was on the flow cytometer, mm -hmm. but I mean, the overlap of the two instruments was. And that's always a problem. Really nice. That's always the problem, you know, like you really need somebody really good, like Nicole or somebody to do this transition. Because y you lose a lot of information. Yeah. I mean, the way you can fill it up is just assuming this line to be real and then kind of refill it up mm. with data. But how, you know, that's going to give you a steady state. It's not going to give you this transient conditions are the coolest one because then you can use particle size distribution, this bump on the particle size distribution here to talk about the changes in environmental characteristics, talk about actually phytoplankton and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about more on Friday. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, we shall. My internet connection is bad. What's the uh, Dropbox or wherever you So Neil start, has started uploading them. Yes, if you go to the website, the resource page, you might have to refresh your browser and not be able to use the My connection is bad. My connection is bad. I can't. I can't load the the Plankton Chronicles oh, at all. You probably are because you probably are guest. Because I'm only paying overhead, full overhead here. They don't want to give me a password. This is a U main computer. Yes, it's in Tempest. and it's connected. And then it's going to say this. Yes, yeah, so I can register it on the mic. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can do it. Mm, they don't want to give me. No, they don't want to. I don't have that stuff. You want to take my team here? No. I have to remember that. You just. Uh, uh, can somebody just put a password so I have normal internet connect? Niels, do you have a password? Does anybody has a password to share? That's the reason why my MATLAB doesn't work because I can't put government MATLAB on this one. What? I can't put government MATLAB on this one. So I have you main MATLAB because they took away my passwords. I can't get MATLAB on this thing because I can't put government MATLAB on this computer. And, it, and Mat you main doesn't work anymore. Yeah. We'll make it my lab computer. Sure. Do whatever you want. When I buy a new one, I'll just give it to you. No. I know. Just, just No, it's just a hand wise to wait. Stop. What was clicking? Well, we need to disconnect from the network. Yeah, just Okay. Limited. Okay. I think it should be fine now. The answer it's. <laughs> it's just a good playlist. Yeah, working. Awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, now we're talking, yeah. I got that book to my little intern when he graduated from high school. This book, the, the Plankton Chronicle, or whatever the name of the book is. 
It's like 30 bucks now on Amazon. It's just so beautiful. Yeah, just put it on a put it on a, on a tea table and then people will think that you're really smart. Uh, no, it's just it's just amazing. The imagery is great and there's enough of the enough of the insight from the perspective of being just optical oceanographer to give you some idea about the diversity and, and knowledge. So I'm trying to find a specific specific thing, so I'm gonna be clicking around. Have you seen it? Or this video? Yeah. But I'm looking for one specific thing. For my trick questions. I don't remember my stickers, I have to find them. I think they're in the back of them. Okay, somebody, um, I'll find it later, okay? And I'll show it to you guys. It is in this video when this, this centric diatom goes back and forth. I know, but you know which one that I mean. When this, I know, this is the, I think it was in diatom one. Hmm? I'm just I just went to Plankton Chronicles. I mean it's oh, hmm? I'll I'll find it, okay? Uh, I'll find it and I'll show it to you guys later. Let's just continue and get this grind over with. I'm sorry? Oh no, no is, just, is there one, two, three, four? Uh, are everybody here? Is your buddy here? <laughs> yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Once we were uh, we were backpacking through Italy, and there were six of us, and we're running into like metros and stuff, and we had a deal is like where somebody was one, and you just you know because everybody runs in the same thing, and everybody's sitting on top of each other, so you just yell one, and you hear two, three, four, five, six. So you guys can develop that. Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> there should be twenty. <laughs> Okay, so I um, talked about a little bit about particles. We're going to talk a little bit more about Friday, taxonomic approach. I went, touched a little bit upon the molecular stuff, just so, so you guys know that, that there exists out there and, and, and that, you know, many people working on it. And, and there's lots of many people trying to work on connecting these classical taxonomy um, to molecular um, uh, phylogenetic trees and actually make some meaningful connection that is going to allow us to go back in the history of time and use these knowledge that we have of these classically taxonomy described species to the, um, to the newly found information from the evolution and, 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 you know, these relationships and so on. So one other way that you can look at the phytoplankton is through chemistry. Um, and most important so is through pigments. I'm not going to talk about too much about minerals and metabolites. I, I'll, I mentioned them a little bit, but I'm going to be mostly focusing on pigments here. Um, Chlorophyll A might be okay for spinach, um, but when you're in the ocean, you need a little bit more, you know? <laughs> it's a great, I mean, plants have lots of uh, high diversity of the pigments, but what, what is really cool about phytoplankton is that they have this great diversity of the phytoplankton, uh, of these this pigments that actually impact their, um, have certain role in the in a, in a machinery of the cell, but it also change um, their optical properties. And you're going to see yourself and, and see us trying to jump on these opportunities and looking how these different pigment structures are actually modifying the absorption spectra and so on, and trying to use to discern them different these different types of the phytoplankton. You know? uh, generally, we can we can divide pigments into light harvesting pigments and photoprotective pigments. Light harvesting pigment, the most famous one is chlorophyll. Now that's the one that you guys know that it's harvesting the light. But many other ones actually are helping chlorophyll harvest that light. So the synthesis is not the thing that happens where the, you know, chlorophyll is floating around the cell. It's part of the complex of proteins and other pigments that make the magic happen. I'm going to go towards that stuff. Um, there's lots of pigments that are photoprotective. Light's awesome. We like light. We're phytoplankton. You know, for example, you really like hmm, lobsters, no? 
and you start eating lobsters, awesome, you get another lobster, and the lobster keep on coming, lobster keep on coming, then you're in a certain situation which you cannot eat lobsters anymore, but the lobsters are keep on coming because your belly's full. Now you can't, you're done with lobster. The lobster keep on coming, keep on coming. So what you're gonna have, you're gonna invite your buddy, your foot of protective pig is gonna jump in front and say, yo, I'll eat the lobsters. You chill out a little bit, deal with the stuff, and maybe the flow of the lobster is gonna go down, and it does eventually, you know, the light, the sun goes, starts getting, getting less intensive and so on, and then, you know, with the help of the photoprotective pigments, you're going to actually obstruct the damage that might happen due to the presence of the light um, in the cell without going to, to, deep, <laughs> to deep biochemistry. Think about it as, you know, the lobster. But sometimes it can happen, what we want to prevent is you just completely dying of lobster. And this is what sometimes happens in a cell. You can have these damages to the photosystem of the cell. They're caused by the intense light. Um, they will just, you know, drive the, the, the intense, uh, your capability of doing photochemistry to zero and sometimes death, no? That's why the pho photoprotective pigments are great. They, they help in a very specific way, in a very determined way based on the different, different pigments um, to kind of help you with the situations that are not really great, not just with the loss, not just with the light, but sometimes there's other things happening in the cell that might be not really great for the photosystem. They will jump in there too, no? And then there's, um, so th these, these awesome helpers are here, no? And then you have these phycobilins. These, these are the type of pigments that um, are kind of mostly associated with the cyanobacteria. And they're actually not like, you know, everything is a molecule, but they're kind of pigments. They're, 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 they're actually protein type pigments, no? And those are the ones that are really cool. They help us de detect the, the Cyrenococcus and Procolococcus. Um, they fluoresce um, and, um, and they're really, really dominant in cyanobacterial world. Um, so her royal highness chlorophyll. If chlorophyll pays your paycheck, sorry, go ahead. Just going back. Yes. Can you go back and play? Sorry, I don't know very much about pigments. And did you say that all the carotenoids are photoprotective? No. no, no. Carotenoids are divided by, and I'm going to go slowly through them, no? I'm just saying, so carotenes, there's like a beta carotene, an alpha carotene, carrot, carrot, carotene, orange, carrot. Um, those are usually part of the photosynthetic system that actually help you harvest the sun. They can help out a little bit with the fur protection. But these xanthophiles, these guys are the, your photoprotectors, okay? And, and these, these can actually be diagnostic. So somebody asked yesterday, I think I spoke about that already. Somebody asked, can you use the phaophyte in order to diagnose the amount of grazing? And there's, you know, some questions about it. But with the xanthophiles, when you're looking at the ratio of different xanthophiles present in specific cells, and you know the pathway that happens during the photo issues in a cell, you can actually use them to diagnose something about processes in a cell. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but I can put a paper in here that is um, there's a really one cool paper where they're looking at the ratios of two different xanthophiles specific for the diatoms to infer the light history and the light damage. Is that cool? Awesome. Yeah. Royal Highness Chlorophyll. If you're a geek, you can have it printed 3D and put it on your, on your, on your Christmas tree, no? Uh, I paid for that Christmas tree, no? Um, paid for everything. <laughs> um, so chlorophyll, I um, mean, Colin spoke to you about, you're going to see this molecule a lot. And there's many different types of chlorophyll, no? And, and the, the ones that you're going to be hearing about is mostly chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, um, chlorophyll A specifically. Uh, the molecular structure, um, you know, the structure of the cell, we we'll have this porphyrin ring, acetylene magnesium, um, different types of attachments. And you know, the edges of the porphyrin ring will be modified different types of main chlorophylls. When you start going into chlorophyll D and some bacterial chlorophylls and D vinyl chlorophylls, these, these changes are going to be different. Um, for your further knowledge about pigments, I cannot go through all of them. Um, this is all of them. I mean, there's a gazillion of them. I'm going to leave this book. Please check it out. Um, I would mean if you're going to go into pigments and stuff, I would recommend buying this book. No, you get your advisor to buy the book. No, it's a great book to have in the lab because you're going to find, you know, for example, you know, the the adenochrome. I think this is one of those centophiles, the helpers, just based on the structure. You know, and you find the name, blah blah blah. How does it look in HPLC? How does it act in different solvents? The absorption, fluorescence spectra. It's a great reference, no? And it has some, you know, has some nice knowledge in before too. Um, good book. So, if you have a question about pigment, I'm going to try to answer it. I'm going to cover the main pigments here, but it's all of them. Um, so, 
Cohen talked about this stuff, and she talked about how important chlorophyll is, and that's, you know, like, a different perspective. And, and she went back to the absorption, talk, talked about, you know, the spectra of the chlorophyll A, spectra of the chlorophyll B. And she said one thing, that the peaks of the spectra, you know, will change based on the solvent. So now I'm still sitting at that molecule that is hanging on my Christmas tree. I'm just talking about the molecule of chlorophyll. Take this molecule of the chlorophyll and put it in different solvent, just because of the polarity of the solvent. The molecule is going to start acting a little bit different optically. So what you're going to see that if you put the pure chlorophyll A in acetone, as you're going to be doing it during this class, your two, uh, two absorption maxima are going to be here. If you put a diethyl ether, you're going to have a shift for 2 nanometers. Then ethanol, a shift to 4 nanometers. Methanol, very similar um, to the ethanol. So the polarity of the, of the media is going to make it act in a different way. It's going to change the structure and modify slightly the absorption peaks. The same thing is going to happen with the chlorophyll B and many of these pigments that are not protein-based. No? So all that stuff you can find in this book. However, when the chlorophyll is in the cell, it's part of this magical mechanism, this, this photo, photosynthetic mechanism. So this bleh here is actually photosystem two. It's the protein structure, is the protein, the third level, I think, protein structure. And all these little green things up there are the chlorophylls, no? And all these little twirly things are different proteins that these chlorophylls are embedded in. So see the little green, green things up here? Those are the chlorophylls. And you're going to see some brown things here. Those are the keratin, beta, beta keratonide. Beta keratin, I can't pronounce the word in English. So there's other pigments, and so, so what you get is you get this upper portion, which is actually the antenna, portion of the antenna for the system that's actually accepting um, these, uh, these photons of light. There's many chlorophylls in there, and there's many other pigments there. And then there's going to be this whole magical structure down here that I'm not going to go into details. They will allow the transfer of this energy through the way that, that um, Colin was talking about, you know, the energy transfer up and down and left and right into the other portions of the photosynthetic complex in the cell. So this thing, so this is the third level, I think, protein structure, now becomes this. So this is this photosynthesis system too. So this is the, uh, the, the study Colin was talking about. I'm just trying to put the schematic and put this in a space. So chlorophyll is not floating in the cell. Chlorophyll is embedded in a complex molecular, you know, complex protein structure that is now embedded in a, in a membrane of, um, of either plastic or a cell. We'll see later. Chlorophyll you're going to find in PS2, you're going to find in PS1. It's going to accept the light. There's going to be these little brown things, beta carotenoids. They're going to accept light as well. The magic is going to happen. There's going to be a transfer of electrons. It's going to lead ultimately to the synthetase, synthesis of the ATP, which is actually like the money, the energy money of the cell. Once you zoom on once again, this membrane in which the protein complex, in which the chlorophyll is sitting, um, shit, it has to go here. It's actually going, sitting in this silicoid membrane that in the eukaryotic cell is sitting within a plastid, no? So this little pill here, the membrane, that's where the that photosystem, the whole photosystem is sitting, both of the photosystems in which the chlorophyll is sitting inside of the protein complex. So it's not floating freely in a cell. Okay, this is a case for eukaryotic cell. In a prokaryotic cell, I said earlier, we don't have any organelles, we don't have any structures. So, so these membranes are actually um, in the, in, it, just like when you have the exterior wall, you're going to have these silicon membranes. They're inside of the cell. They're not separated as in organelles. We're going to have these photosystem structures embedded in the silicon membrane. This whole thing, this whole photosystem 2, cytochrome <coughs> photosystem 1, can be written in a different way, very similar to the one that Colin was showing you yesterday. It talks about the energy of the different um, acceptors in the cell. So this is actually a combination of, this, of, the, of the schematic that Colin was showing yesterday. How does different chlorof chlorophylls get excited, release the energy, get excited, release the energy? But it's not combined kind of with the structure. And what is really cool, what I like really this, this scheme is that you see all these little dots? That's your antenna. You see how different colors they are? Showing that there's different pigments present in the antenna. It's not only green chlorophyll, but there's other pigments that are helping with this process. It is a photo, 
uh, photosynthetic pigments or <laughs> as a photoprotective pigments. You can see the colors are different because the ratio of different pigments will differ between photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. But just, you know, keep there somewhere in the back of your head and hopefully you're going to take a class that's going to teach you more. One really extremely important thing to remember is that when the light gets absorbed by the cell, not everything goes to photosynthesis. We really always talk about light photosynthesis is awesome. Majority of this energy that is absorbed into the cell as the light goes into the heat. An average 60% of it in the open ocean, not in lab experiments, goes into the heat. Fluorescence is 7%. And then what we have left over is photosynthesis. This is the average for the world's ocean. No? If you have a bloom, if you have an unhappy cell, if the cell is scoffing, the cell didn't have enough iron, if the cell didn't have something, this ratio will change. Overall, in the world's ocean, the, light, the, the energy that is taken from the light is going to be distributed in this way. Just remember that, that not the, all the energy is coming and that the actual fluorescence is a teeny tiny portion. So when you start measuring chlorophyll fluorescence, think about that. You know, if, I, if, if, this, you know, if, if the phytoplankton has a flu, this ratio will change. So your chlorophyll fluorescence to chlorophyll ratio will change as well. Okay, so I'm showing you this. So phytoplankton is in the protein complex, in the membrane that is, in this case, embedded inside of the plastic, in this case, inside of this membrane, inside of the cell. With that ha what happens now with the absorption peaks of the chlorophyll, they start changing. Just because, once again, when you put them in different chemi chemical surroundings, the polarity of the, of the solvent is going to change its capabilities. Here, as well, the fact that it's part of the protein complex is going to modify, so modifying their absorption capabilities. So if you look at the absorption properties here in straight line, of the photosystem 2, we're going to see the peak in 437. And then our absorption peak in the acetone is 530. Okay? So, you know, don't think that you're messing up something when you're doing your measurements or getting different numbers. But mind the fact that if you're making a measurement on 430 of the absorption, remember where did you, is your, is your chlorophyll in vivo inside of the cell or in vitro inside of the uh, some kind of solvent? Is it an acetone or something? Just remember this when, as you go along and do your measurements. Um, this is a light harvesting complex, just so that's a different portion of the, of the molecular structure. Um, carotenoids, I said, really important. They, they're like little, you know, friendly, most of the time friendly helpers. They just, you know, help um, with the photosynthesis as it capturing light and transferring further down to the chlorophyll. But they're also important for this photoprotective um, system in the cell. When you're, somebody's giving you too much lobster, you can't deal with the lobster anymore, you can't deal with the light anymore. So what happens, this xanthophiles, these photoprotective pigments, enter into the conversion process where they're actually taking some of that light and some of the nasty oxygen radicals and converting themselves from one form to another form. Um, presence of different xanthophiles can be used for the discerning different taxonomy types. But the ratio of these two, so xanthin and zeaxanthin, for example, would tell you something about the physiological status of the cell. Okay, they're always going to be present there, but in different ratios if the cell is not doing well, if it's close to photoinhibition because it had too much light or some damage, you're going to have find more zeaxanthin to vialoxanthin than in healthy cells. I know this is a lot. Just remember there's photoprotectants um, and photosynthetic pigments and the there's this whole magical um, story where the pigments come and save the universe and save the cell from going down because there's too much light and bad things happening to the cell. I would really direct you to this book and I will upload some more papers. There's many other pigments that I cannot touch upon, but each of them have their own specific absorption spectra. And this is a, this is a great review of tons of different, the, the most abundant, the most sexy, the most used, pigments that we use in phytoplankton taxonomy. It's in Emmanuel de Vred's paper. You can see this, all these spectra. And they magically somehow inside of the cell form that beautiful spectra that you're going to be looking into for the next couple of days, this, this absorption spectra. And, and then you can start, you know, picking a dose and trying to pull out the peaks of different pigments. And you can be frustrated. You're going to be doing it, not doing it, succeeding. But just remember that all these things come together to make this um, phytoplankton absorption spectra. And just, just because of their absorption peaks, that's how everything functions in a cell. They have to work together in order to do photosynthesis, not chlorophyll. 
the way we take the pigments out of the cell and analyze them is that we usually use high-performance liquid chromatography. Um, the way you would do that stuff is usually you would collect a sample in a filter, put it in liquid nitrogen, send it to NASA or somewhere else, so you don't know what happens. What actually happens, we extract that pigment in certain solvent, and, and we run it to a column. And based on the different molecular structure, they're going to have a different velocities, and they're going to separate in that column. It's in the speed. And then we can then take the output of a column, look at the absorption, um, yeah, like the absorption height of different things that are coming out of the column using specific calibration tools. We can compare them to their standards and then give you a really great spread of all these pigments that are present in your system. Why do you want to know pigments? Well, certain types of phytoplankton have certain types of specific pigments. Why is that so? Going back to evolution, going back to the phylogenetic tree, um, for the cyanobacteria, it's easy. I said they don't have plastids. Their chlorophyll is sitting in those membranes inside of the cell. But when it comes to the eukaryotic cells, the origin of the plastids can be traced back um, through certain processes of endosymbiosis that actually allowed for the evolution. Why are you giggling? I thought I, should, I said something stupid. No? No, okay. I thought you're giggling. I was like, just <laughs> you say something stupid. It doesn't matter. Anyways. When, it, when we talk about the origin on the plastids of the cell, uh, there's this theory of a green lineage and red lineage, you know? And without going into too much, green lineage actually explains the origin of the plastids in some green algae, and the red lineage uh, explains the origin of the plastids for many different phytoplankton that we're gonna, be we're gonna be finding in the ocean. And you can actually trace trace the evolution, to the evolution, these pigments. So just because of the evolutionary processes, the way that these plastids were ending up inside of the cell, we can use different pigments to discern different types of groups. There's a teeny, teeny, tiny written here, but you can, you know, opening up in your PDF. Um, you know, so for within the dinophytes, we have, so dinoflagellates, we have different groups. You know, cryptophytes here, heteroconta, these are the diatoms and kelps. Colithophor is here. It's pretty cool because now pigments become the evolutionary tool, but also become taxonomical tool. And because of those differences, people have been for the last 20, 30 years looking at, you know, kind of grouping different types of phytoplankton using pigments. One of the most abundant way that people are using is this chemtex, which is based on the knowledge that we know that certain types of phytoplankton have certain types of pigments, and based on the samples they have collected in the field, um, where they saw specific type of ratios of pigment versus pigment, they used tables such as this one to predict how much different types of phytoplankton is there in the ocean. Um, for example, chlorophyll C here, it says it's only connected to the brown algae. We know that chlorophyll B, B is connected only to green algaes. So if we have a sample with the chlorophyll B, there's a big chance we have green algae in there. It gets a little bit more you know, complex when you have some pigments present in different groups. And the size of the bowl, so the amount of that pigment that is going to be present in a group, is completely driven by, you, by, by your data set on top of which you're gonna, you, you built your chemtex, your relationships. So mind that. If you're going to use chemtex or any other clustering methods, go and see how they've been developed. If they have been developed at the North Sea, don't take them into the you know, equatorial ocean and try to make groups out of because it's not going to work, you know? So, you know, mind the math behind and biology. But it's actually a pretty good method. Ah, function rule. I'll be done soon. Thank God. Questions? I'm going too fast. Does this make sense? More or less? Flowing? I'm trying to cover a lot. I'm going to be around. If you have, you know, basic questions about biology and everything was over the top, come and ask me. I'll sit down with you. And it's really hard to cover this stuff. I'm assuming that you have some basic knowledge. And maybe it's boring for some of you. I know it's boring for Andre, but you know, just because some of you know really a lot. They're like, you know, you, some people do really lots of phytoplankton taxonomy, so sorry. Function, role. Dinner. How many people are doing their PhD in phytoplankton functional types? Hands up. One, two, three. Oh, that's, that's not bad. You are kind of doing it too. Can't you hands up? Four. <laughs> it's not bad, no? I would expect more. The number is rising. Uh, second? The number is rising, no? Um, this is one to show later, but it will. So number of phytoplankton functional type publications um, in Google Scholar per year has been increasing spectacularly over the years. 
Uh, you can see with the launch of every satellite, you see little bumps, you know? Um, and then with the, with the with in situ instrument development, they allow us hyperspectral and multispectral things. So collecting data in situ parallel to the phytoplankton community structure and stuff, we see this like exponential growth of the phytoplankton functional type, and it's just going to go even higher. So what are phytoplankton functional types? Based on ISCCG report um, that was published in 2014 that is looking at phytoplankton functional types, and it, that's going to be your definite read. Um, these are the groups of organisms irrespective of taxonomic affiliation. They carry out particular function, e.g. a chemical process such as calcification, silicification, nitrogen fixation, or DMS production. Functional groups are also sometimes referred as biogeochemical guilds. So, from everything that we have done so far, um, for example, we had like coccolithophore, calcifying coccolithophore sitting in one group, no? Then we would have nitrogen fixers sitting in one group. Um, then we would have diatoms and silicoflagellates sitting in one group. We would make this, it, it's kind of more of grouping, grouping these phytoplankton organisms in different groups based on their ecological traits. It's a very fluent definition. And what I've been seeing, it's modified based on everybody's needs. So if you have an algorithm that works, look, there's a new functional type discrimination. You know, I'm going to now divide them in big phytoplankton that has pink dots in it and small phytoplankton that can nitrify it because I have an algorithm that discerns it. So th just remember, it's a very flowing definition. Very flowing definition. Um, you know, what, it, what do you define as functional type? All of them produce oxygen. Most of them actually. Heterotrophs don't, you know? So, and, and they have an optical signal. So you can maybe discern the ones that have an optical signal, so they scatter and have chlorophyll, versus the one that they only scatter, and then you can define, divide the one that have produces oxygen, not produce oxygen, no? You can do different functional type based on their size and shape. Uh, so try to use um, some optical tools to define them as picoplankton, nanoplankton, microphytoplankton. These would be functional type, you know? Their shape, balls versus other things, you know? That would give you right away is the size, too, mostly. Transformers are specific nutrients, a nitrogen fixer, calcium carbonate uh, precipitator, um, silica precipitator, um, some of them ballast to enhance sea flux, so that's calcium carbonate, they, they, you know, enhancing carbon flux. Um, different, different things. Um, nutrition value to hyotrophic animals. Um, so when you, when you think about you know, de defining, you know, phytoplankton functional types, you have the yummy one and non-yummy one. I have this theory, I'm going to once get funded, funding to look at the phytoplankton community structure as a function of yumminess of the diet, of the oysters. I think there's something to it, but there is, I mean, in theory, whatever is fed to the oysters will determine the taste that you have in your mouth. From that perspective, I mean, there's lots of money being pushed into, like, looking at the diversity of the phytoplankton from the production. Some of them produce fatty acids, oils and stuff, you know, um, and things like that. So you can actually, you know, develop maybe phytoplankton function types to discern different types of organisms that have more fatty oils or have higher nutritional values, they're going to support your fisheries and coastal ocean. Um, you can use their ability to live in turbulent versus stratified environments. Some, some things like, like diatoms usually tend to like a little more turbid environment than the dinoflagellates do. So you can, you know, develop an algorithm that separates that. So many different things, you know? So like my phytoplankton functional type algorithm is going to be different than your phytoplankton functional type algorithm, stuff like that. And we all want to develop phytoplankton. Everybody wants to do that. Is that really straightforward, no? Yes, go ahead. No. I mean, there's this definition, no? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's where we're taking this class. <coughs> Is it straightforward? Let's start with something simple. Let's take the chlorophyll. We have a 20-year-old data set of chlorophyll. We started with Sevius, we went to Motus, we went to Virus, we have Maris, Old OCI. We have so many algorithms. We know this chlorophyll measuring so well, no? And in the ocean, if you look, you have two to three thousand orders of magnitude of difference in this chlorophyll. So, I mean, I don't have the scale here, but usually in NASA we do log scales. So like, you know, this is some kind of oligotrophic side of notion, 0 0.0001. You can have up to like, you know, 10 or, or, or 100 micrograms of chlorophyll. So you're like talking about more even four or five orders of, orders of magnitude. And we know chlorophyll, no? We know chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is awesome. Therefore, 
from this we can get cell abundances. No? We know our chlorophyll, 20 years, so abundance is for sure. From chlorophyll we can get carbon, you know? We, have, we know how much chlorophyll is there, we know the cell abundance, we can talk about how much carbon is there. And from changing the chlorophyll we can get growth rates. Awesome. It's not that simple. It's a plant in a kitchen problem. Um, that's your basil plant, that you, this is the one that you didn't manage to kill. So you're going to buy two, actually you're going to have one. And then one is going to be sitting next to the windowsill for seven days two weeks, and it's going to have really, really light leaves, no? And then you're going to take it in and put it here far away from the window. And what you're going to start seeing is that those leaves are darkening up. Why is that happening? And I spoke to you about that stuff. Why is that happening? Why, does, why do the leaves of your basil plant next to the window are much lighter than the leaves of the basil plant that is far away from the window? What is the difference? What is the difference? What is the difference between those two environments? Exactly. So, packaging comes out to something else. I'm talking about basil now. I mean, but it's the correct route that you've taken. It's mostly the fact that when your environment where there's lots of light, they don't really need to produce that much chlorophyll because there's lots of light. No, there's a big chance they're going to actually get damaged. When they're in an environment there's not enough light, you're going to start boosting up the amount of chlorophyll per plant. Therefore, chlorophyll per cell. So, thinking about the ocean the areas where there's less light, you're gonna, you can have the same basal plant or the same cell that will have a different chlorophyll to cell ratio than the same algae living somewhere in the middle of the tropics, no, where there's lots of light, without any packaging effect. We didn't go to that one yet. Okay? So that's your first problem. The second problem is that sometimes you're going to remember to feed the cell, to feed your plant with the nutrients, because it's like close to your things, like, oh, look at it, oh, you're going to give it some, you know, nutrients and stuff, it's going to be happy plant, you know. And then sometimes you're going to forget to give it any kind of, <laughs> any kind of fertilizer, like my plants, and you're going to just be surprised they're alive at all. And actually, that will also affect their color. So what actually happens in the environment is that this chlorophyll to carbon ratio that we very often use to, to infer the, the, you know, this transition from the chlorophyll to carbon export and everything that we care about in the carbon world, it's highly variable based on the growth irradiance. What you see here is if you look at the green dots, and this is a nutrient replete environment, these guys have everything what they need, you're going to see the increase in the carbon to chlorophyll ratio as the light increases. So that's your, you know, carbon, your, your basal plate upside down. So in theory you're getting a decrease in chlorophyll per carbon concentration as you're increasing light because they need less chlorophyll because they have more light. You know? The same thing will have an impact on the cell division rate. No? So there's a trend here. If we take this trend in a chlorophyll to carbon ratio and plot it as a function of cell division rate, what we see that when the cell division rate is small for the nutrient replete conditions, your chlorophyll to carbon ratio is going to be different than when the cell division rate is high. But for the nutrient limited conditions, things flip around. Uh, so these are, these are data from uh, Berenfeld's 2016 paper, and Emmanuel is one of the co-authors on it. And it's something that he's been working on a lot. So this is, you know, some other people have been working for a long, long time. Um, where they're looking at these growth rates and chlorophyll to carbon ratios as a function of physiology and physiological processes that happen in the cell. And to a certain extent, they will be also driven by taxonomical composition of your environment. So with knowing just these, you know, couple of graphs, are you really sure that all the variability that you see here is just driven by the changes in chlorophyll concentration? And that you can very easily, just for the chlorophyll, they really know that well, derive all these things. You're not anymore. There's a certain percentage, maybe not that big, but significant one that makes mess, can mess up your thesis. I mean, it's actually really cool and sexy when you look at It's actually, that variability is, is due to the physiological processes in the cell. They're driven by environmental conditions. So just remember that. So if this is something that happens with the chlorophyll, and this is called photoadaptation, no? This is the kitchen, the plant in the kitchen problem. Think about how, mu how much will it impact 
further down as you're taking towards, you know, der deriving phytoplankton functional type using the hyperspectral imagery and stuff like that. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, try to focus on specific morphological and structural characteristics. You know, there's a specific pigment structure that leads to specific optical signal. For example, for the Karenia brevis, yeah, it's Karenia brevis. It has that one specific, you know, um, pigment and it's really easy to discern it, you know. So go after that one. <coughs> specific size will lead to specific optical signal. And we're going to cover that on Friday. Maybe that's the way to, to kind of play with it. But don't take it too lightly. Know your <laughs> measurements. And in mind the ecology and the environment. Um, and uh, as Colin said, you might not be able to find an optical pattern for the Alexandrian, but Alexandrian blooms where all the other dinoflagellates bloom, so you know the timing, and they usually bloom in specific water types. They have a certain amount of nutrients for, for, their, you know, for their growth. So take that in consideration when, when you're thinking about developing phytoplankton functional types. And you know, that's this portion, you know, and, and, and then that's going to, you know, con you know, make the connection between the chlorophyll and IOP concentrations to, to allow you to develop in a specific community composition. Um, in the end, I just want to say, <laughs> now I'm going to be sounding like a preacher, but you're going to learn a lot during your class. We're going to teach you a lot how bad, how hard, how bad these measurements can be, how hard is it to make good measurements by understanding the methodology going to be understanding the variability that is associated with that methodology make able to discern the natural uh, signals. So know your friends and know your enemies when it comes to the measurements. Be realistic. You know, please validate before you start publishing climate-driven changes in the part of phytoplankton functional types because it will come to my table and I will destroy that paper. I will. I have no, I am not invited to any more phytoplankton functional type group sessions and some of you can answer, ask your advisors because I would stand up and yell at them. I will do that. Validate. Make sure it works for yourself, no? So, um, yay. And then do magic. So, this is it. I don't have anything else. Do you guys have questions? Was this too fast? I really tried to cover a lot. Yeah, it was a lot of stuff. I know, but I tried to make it a story. Just kind of like a story and and there's, there's not enough time for me to tell you everything beautiful. I'm here. These guys are awesome, but phytoplankton, ask us everything. And Friday, we're going to have Nicole Bolton, who's the magician with Flowcam. She's going to come and bring the Flowcam. We're going to do flow side about, you know, you guys are going to be able to see this phytoplankton in so many different ways, you know. So, you know, work on that. Seize the opportunity that we know about phytoplankton. Yes, please. Museophyte, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of, kind of, yeah. Museophytes, haptophytes, and then you have Primnesiophytae. I think prim Primnesiophytae is actually a family, while the haptophyte is an order. I can look it up for you. It's really, I'm like, I'm either. those things are so fluid, you know, so that's why, like, you know, I always kind of come back and say, diatoms, eh. Uh, because, you know, things, uh, just with the, with the way the genetic tree works now, like sometimes things become like, you know, move from the level of family and up and down and up and down. But yeah, haptophytes, haptophytes are higher than primnesiophytes. So they're kind of sitting, they're always at a higher taxonomic level, whatever it is. Huh? Break? Break? Are we doing breaks? Ask me questions, I'm here. If you're embarrassed about anything, you don't know what DNA is, come and ask me. Ask any of us. Don't ask Manuel, but ask us. Okay, awesome. Go. I'll put all these papers that I've cited in, this, in the share box, and even if they look super scary, I tried to find them to be reviews. So when you're reading an annual reviews, uh, they're really cool because on, on the left side of the paper, they, have, they go with all these different terms that they're using and make a definition. They're really simple. So, you know, kind of open them up, have them as a reference. Okay. I'm going to find that stuff. You guys think about some questions. Do you have any questions? Yes. You would OCB. No, I was there too. It's, it's usually environmental conditions that are changing availability, usually of the nutrients, of fertilizers. And I was talking to the lady, that was the UMass, um, 
University of Maryland lady with a really cool looking slides, no? Was that the, we were at OCB, no? Ocean. Oh, that was the Plymouth one. There was the same talk at Ocean Carbon Biogeochemistry. It was, it was a lady who was talking about, you know. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, shit, shit, shit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, shit. How do we go back? Ah, okay. Focus on this. Wait. Okay. Wait. Wait for it. I'll answer your question. Wait. Okay. Why is it doing this? Why was it doing that? Let's go back. I thought of, think about what I, everything what I told you about this guy. What was he doing? Where was he taking the images? On the microscope that was on the Tara, and Tara is a, and the ship goes. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? <laughs> it's actually the movement in Tara. You can see it. We're just like phytoplankton. Because I was looking at this. Did you, were you the one who told me that? I was like, I was like, why is it moving? Why is it doesn't stabilize that sample and stuff? And then it's actually, it's Tara movement. It's a movement of the ship. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, anyways, nobody gets a sticker. I get a sticker. <laughs> no, yeah, everybody gets a sticker, but not a big sticker. Um, question about mixer mix trophy. So, um, I spoke to the lady who does mixotropes, and I was concerned about, you know, what is the cost to the primary, pr you know, the, so, so, you know, they can switch from one to another. And based on the, usually it's nutrient availability, nutrient conditioning that, that is, is going to cause the, the, the troph autotrophic part going to the heterotrophic part of the cell. And so the, my question that I had, what is going to be the cost for the primary productivity, the autotrophic side of the story towards the heterotrophic? You know, are we losing some of this carbon, you know, that is actually being produced that we've been accounted for? And she really didn't know the answer. You know? She knew for a fact that, you know, they use this on top of it. Kind of so like if we want to use this chlorophyll and there's enough chlorophyll, whenever there's chlorophyll, we can run the classical prime productivity models. There's just an additional aspect of it. And there's going to bring additional carbon to it. So it will not change your calculation from the perspective of the prime productivity. They will always do the productivity, but when you think about the carbon that is within a cell and gets exported, you're going to have extra carbon now. That's what she told me. Does that make sense, what I just said? No, really. So what she's saying, and I don't agree with her, is that um, it's, you know, there's an heterotrophic and hodotrophic stuff. So now what, with the way the prime productivity works, you have the, the Mole. You're just assuming that everything that has chlorophyll inside is continuously photosynthesizing and producing carbon, a certain amount of carbon. No? That, that's how the model works. No? So she's saying that's still the case, but they're just going to help themselves a little bit on the side. So from the, that perspective, if you want to use Berenfeld's model to calculate not only how much carbon, because what Berenfeld's model gives you is how much carbon is being produced. No? Yeah, He, he just he would for the certain concentration of the chlorophyll. He's not saying this is go. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 that's that's built from the from the field data. No, that's built from the field data. Yeah. And they're they're gonna start and and, and they're gonna start dying. So so your your model is still gonna stay. Your model. You still, if you run your model, all this chlorophyll that is present there will be used for photosynthesizing and will be satisfied by the model. But where the problem is going to be is the carbon that is in a cell is not only made by photosynthesis, but also came from a different, different source, in this case, heterotrophic source. So if you're going to calculate how much carbon is made with the photosynthesis versus the one that you're going to see from remote sensing satellite, that is, you know, remote sensing, there's going to be a difference that can be attributed to heterotrophic portion of the uptake. So now when it comes to the export, you can no longer just think about um, primary productivity broad carbon that is going to sink out, but if you're going to have a rise of the mixotrophs, now you have to account for heterotrophic carbon 
that was brought into that cell by different ways. Does that make sense? But ultimately, yeah. that carbon that came in from the heterotrophs was derived from carbon. Exactly, no. So, It does because you're adding you are adding one step. Yeah, so you're losing. Exactly. Up to ninety percent. Because if you think about the you know transfer of the carbon from step to step, but I think we're fine still. What they're seeing is that with the um, with the changes in the environment, they're claiming at least a couple of people that I saw talking is that with the changes in the environment that are very similar to the ones that we're predicting happening with the climate change, you're gonna see the rise of the mixotrophs. So all these, all, these, all these models have been made based on a field data, you know? They haven't taken like, you know, a specific, you know, chlorella thing and did it in the experiment in the lab and based on that one they build the prime productivity model. This is field data. So it's already the, the diversity of the phytoplankton cells and different types of trophic, trophic types is taken in consideration to a certain ex extent, you know? But if you start shifting, if you start seeing gigantic shift, um, to really world dominated by mixotrophs, those things might not really account for everything. I hope this is a good answer. But if you have a chlorophyll, you have to photosynthesize. If not, you know the lobster scene where people are throwing lobster at you? It's happening. What are you going to do with that chlor with, the, with, the, with, the, with the light? You don't need, I mean, and you're living in an extreme environment, ocean is an extreme environment. You're going to drop that chlorophyll really fast and make it into something else. Have a chlorophyll, you're photosynthesizing. Does it work for like some types of ciliates that they get the prey, they get the carbon, but they keep the chloroplasts? Mm, the yeah, and that's kind of that. Uh, that's the kleptoplastidia, kleptoplastids. Yeah. Um, klepto means to steal plastids, plastids. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of. And I mean, the whole tree of evolution of the plastids that I saw actually came. Most of it came from this behavior where some of these plastids that were stolen actually just kind of became part of the cells and entered in this whole process of of you know being part of the cellular uh, organism, then kind of just stayed around, sticked around forever. So what happens with these, um, these plastids have been stolen. Um, yeah, very often ciliates have capability of photosynthesizing just because they stole the plastids from the phytoplankton and they become mixotrophs. Although these plastids are not theirs, they become mixotrophs, so. Is that production like, does anybody know if it's like proportional like to what was the original one in the phytoplankton compared to like what is now inside the ciliate? I'm sure there's studies out there and that I don't know of. But you know who can answer the question? Nicole Poulton. There's a sea study that we say. I'm sorry? There's a sea slug. Yeah, there's also a sea slug that takes the, yeah. Takes the plastics. And puts it, puts it in and photosynthesizes for some time. I don't know if you remember, like, 2013 to 14 in December, we have this massive bloom of mesothelium. Mm-hmm. Room down. Because, like, it was 800 kilometers of black mm -hmm. water. And it was like, we went to sample, it was below one meter that it was like 30 centimeters of pure chlorophyll. It was like 187 milligrams or, and it was just miserable. Yeah. Um, I, I was referring you to, I mean, I don't know not ab enough about it. I was referring you to Nicole because I know for a fact they've been looking, they have a data set, um, time series at the Bigelow doc, where they're looking at Sinecobacus? Something and then Micromonas, no? Micromonas, or whichever one you had. Uh, is mesodinium? Mesodinium, no, no. No, mesodinium. I think it's mesodinium, yeah. rubrum, no? Or whatever it's called now. And they're actually seeing this beautiful six something, whatever it was, I think in the middle eats Sinecococcus, and then mesodinium comes and eats this something. So there's like yum yum, no? Two steps of yum yums. And, and um, what they're seeing, they're seeing this really like, tum, 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 like, you know, like the little rabbit and, and the story about the rabbit and fox and ecology. They just kind of like follow each other with these beautiful, you know, curves of the growth. Anyways, she's been looking at that for some time. So she's going to be able to tell you. Because I mean, probably there had to be, there had to be conditions that are such that are going to support, you know, the, the growth of, of this, you know, cis, you know, autos photosynthetic ciliates, you know. Um, yeah, they're really important in the coastal coastal conditions and coastal waters. Okay, we're gonna take a break. Coffee, pee pee break. Thank you. Ask me more if you need anything.